Hey folks, welcome back to another edition of Data Science One. Uh, today we've uh, got a, a bunch of information to throw at you about uh, inference. Uh, so we've been talking uh, so far about uh, the, the modeling part of our data science lifecycle, uh, building up lots of ways in which you can uh, interrogate and, and represent uh, the, the data and questions that, that you have. Um, but the, the thing that we're left at as we move towards the, the final stage of our projects, which is uh, analysis and visualization, is how, uh, how do we interpret and, and share these outputs in, in a way that, that's meaningful and, and especially that's accurate. Um, and so, so in our lecture today, we're going to talk about uh, how we can use statistical analysis to improve our visualizations and our, our claims and statements uh, by accounting for uncertainty uh, as we look at the, the outputs of our models or, or the data that we have in our, our data frames. So in, in particular, uh, the, the issue of uncertainty communication is something that is, uh, I, I think, a, a major weak point of a lot of, of data science um, in that uh, the the assertion and, and kind of the, especially the, the place that, that we're coming from as data scientists is, is very much an, an authority, authoritative stance on, on a problem. And when we say we think, uh, you know, our model predicts this output, um, it's, it's very easy to, to take that for granted and, and not to consider all of the potential assumptions we've made and all of the potential uncertainty that, that comes about just through sampling or collecting or, or working with data. Um, and, and as we've seen throughout, there's lots of opportunities for sampling to be imperfect or for model assumptions to come creeping in. And, and the way that we express those uh, is, is very difficult to do. We've talked so far about being as transparent as we possibly can throughout these data science pipelines. Uh, but, but to be honest, most uh, the, the people who will get the most benefit from that are fairly technical users and readers. Um, and, and what we're looking for are ways to uh, hopefully succinctly and, and straightforwardly get across exactly how much uncertainty we have about any uh, prediction or, or, or claim that we're making. Um, so in, in particular, uh, this, this article, I, I want to highlight the last paragraph that says data science isn't just about producing graphs and chart. It's about leveraging data and mathematics to encode and, and uh, help guide and inform. Communicating uncertainties and results must be recognized as part of that process. Uh, so, so absolutely, uh, we, we, we need to be communicating all of the results about our data and how unsure we are about those results is, is a, a crucial and, and major part of that. And we've seen that uh, a lot in, in perhaps the, the most public version of data science lately, which is the, the presidential election. Uh, some of our, our favorite sites uh, in this class, like 538, do a really nice job of, uh, of showing the uncertainty in their models. Um, so, so here uh, on, on the left, you see a, a, a kind of bootstrap method of, of using lots of different potential models. Um, this this uh, ensemble type approach uh, shows that uh, you know many of the models uh, skew one way, but also many models skew the other way based off of uncertainty in, in our data or in our models. Um, and you can see that uh, as as a little bit more continuous probability distributions on the right, looking at uh, at many simulations uh, uh, together instead of th this uh, this discretized sample on the left. But but either way, these are really nice representations that show that there's this broad array of possible outcomes. And when we talk about what the average or expected outcome is, that's uh, ignoring a, a lot of the, the variation in this problem, which is, is really important for understanding what the likelihood of the different outcomes are. Um, and, and that's you know, extremely important if, if you care about things uh, in, in particular cases and, and not just averages over large samples. So, you know, we know that if we repeat some game, if we flip a coin a, a million times and we're going to uh, approximate the mean, but uh, especially in cases like an election where you only get one shot at it, um, the, the variation and, and the, the uh, expected uh, spread of outcomes becomes really, really important for, for how you communicate um, what, what you think will happen. 
uh, a famous uh, example in in this uh, in this realm uh, is that uh, the the election uh, between uh, Truman and, and Dewey was famously predicted incorrectly, and and newspapers came out the next day uh, noting that that Dewey won the election despite uh, despite the fact that he actually ended up losing. Um, and so so here's a a great example of of uh, the the reporters and and perhaps also the the, the pollers. Um, and, and, and syndicates not uh, not realizing just how much uncertainty was in their prediction about who would win the election um, and, and making a, a very false claim as a result of that. Uh, so uh, let's let's talk a, a little bit uh, about the the broad um, overview here of, of inference and then we'll start to, to get into some specific methods. So this a lot of this is, is stuff that we've covered early in the semester when we uh, did our intro to statistics, and, and distributions, because that's the, the major tool we're going to use here, is analysis of distributions and, and probability. Um, and, and hopefully uh, many of you have seen this in your prior stat courses as well, uh, but we're going to do a, a broad overview for, for those of you who don't, just to make sure we're all on the same page. And then, uh, like always in this class, talk about some uh, really specific uh, practical implications and, and considerations. So at the, the high level, uh, we've been talking so far in, in modeling about uh, predictions uh, where we're trying to, uh, to make a model that uh, is able to, uh, to forecast the, the outcomes of some unseen new data sample or, or data set. Uh, this is our, our held out uh, generalization or test sets. Uh, in inference, we're trying to say something uh, more fundamental to the, the population that we're drawing those samples from. Um, and, and of course, the, these two things are, are very closely related. Um, and so uh, when we talk about uh, population parameters, uh, this is, uh, is, is very closely linked to the statistics that we get from our samples. In fact, uh, with, uh, with one sample, your best estimate of the population parameters, like its mean or median, is that parameter, the, the mean or median of your sample. Um, but of course, we know that the samples have some variation. Um, even if they're, they're conducted perfectly, they still have random chance. Um, and, and there's lots of opportunities for, for sampling bias to come in as well, like, like we talked about earlier in the semester. Um, and, and since we almost never have access to the whole population, uh, whenever we're saying something about the population from a sample, we need to be really careful about expressing just how uncertain we are about about the statistics that we we pull out from the, the sample that we have, um, and so uh, so uh, as as yeah we we just mentioned this that the, the estimate of, of the population uh, parameter comes from the the sample. So inference is, is all about drawing these higher level conclusions give, given uh, only uh, usually a single random sample. So uh, so how do we go from a, a single random sample into uh, some statistics that, that has some uh, measure about our uncertainty um, if, if we just have uh, have one draw. Uh, so so we'll, we'll get into the, the technical detail in a second, but but just to, uh, to, to place this in what we've talked about before, uh, the, the uh, tool we're going to use are p-values, uh, which is the, the probability that, that we think some event uh, occurred uh, just by chance or, or because there was some, uh, some underlying signal uh, that, that provided the evidence that, that this was true. So with, uh, with, with this example of, uh, of, of p-values for, for jelly beans, uh, we, we see uh, you know, lots of, of statistical tests suggesting uh, that, that they're looking for some relationship between jelly beans and, and in this case, acne. And uh, what's the, the chance that, uh, that any of these relationships happen just because of chance or because of some correlation or, or we, we might even hope uh, causation, though we usually can't go that far with our, uh, our, our p-values. So the, the, the way that we think about these uh, p-values is, is to look at the, uh, the probabilities of the, the distributions of, of our data. So uh, we, we've talked earlier in the semester about the, the probability distributions of, of data in our data frame. Uh, we're going to uh, apply those same ideas, but, but mainly focus, about, focus them on the outcome of, uh, of statistical tests. Um, 
in, in today's lecture, um, looking at the, the, the variance of, of comparisons and, and how likely some comparison is to be, uh, to be by, by chance or not. And, and we'll get into exactly what that means with, with an example here. Um, so, so let's say uh, there is some, uh, some true value that, that we are going to uh, assume uh, is, is the population mean for, for some, uh, some variable. And in this example here, it's the, the number of tattoos. Uh, not, not totally sure what the, the context is for this one. Um, but, uh, but we have some probability distribution. In this case, it's a, a discretized sample um, that is looking at the, the number of tattoos for each of these, um, for each of the individuals in this sample. Uh, and we see that the, the, the mean of that or, or the median of that, uh, that sample is, is different from what we suggest uh, is, is the case for the, the population. Um, and and we're, we want to ask how likely is it that we would get a, a sample mean that's this far away um, if, if it were the case that the, 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 true, um, the true population mean was, uh, in this case, 5 on, on the left. And we can uh, extrapolate that idea just a, a little bit by saying that instead of comparing one, the center of a distribution to some value, we could also compare the centers of, of two distributions with our, our two sample t-tests. Uh, now, now, hopefully many of you are familiar with these t-tests um, from, from your intro stat classes. Um, and, and we're going to ask uh, for, for these hypotheses, um, is the pattern that we're seeing uh, likely because of some underlying data, or, or is it because of chance? So we're going to define a null hypothesis that says that the data that we're looking at uh, actually come from the, the, the same distribution, or is there's no difference between the two distributions that we're looking at. Uh, and contrary to this, an alternative hypothesis is saying that the data that, that we're seeing in these two groups actually come from different underlying sources, uh, which is, is just to say that the null hypothesis is not true, or we have sufficient evidence to, to reject the null hypothesis, is often how it'll be framed. Uh, so I may be dating myself here by uh, showing the, the tables of this in, in the back of textbooks. Um, you guys may not, uh, may not be familiar with this. If so, feel free to ignore it. Uh, but it's just uh, showing explicitly how for different values of how far away your uh, potential uh, suggested uh, population parameter is from the center of your sample distribution, just how unlikely it is that your sample distribution came from that uh, assumed population. Um, and this is your p-value, what the probability is that, uh, that the null hypothesis is true, and these are the same distribution. So uh, this, this p-value is something we'll, we'll focus on a, a good amount today and, and is a, a really key statistical takeaway from your analysis, uh, almost regardless of, of what project you're doing. Um, and the, this is, is kind of exactly what we said, the probability of obtaining the results uh, that are uh, as you've found them or more extreme away from uh, the, the null hypothesis. Um, so uh, to, to make this a little bit more clear, a high p-value means that the null hypothesis is very likely to be true, uh, that, it, that it came from the, the same distribution, uh, which is to say that, that there's no difference between the two. If it's highly likely that they're the same, uh, you, you can't say with, with any uh, confidence that they're coming from different distributions where a very low p-value that says it's very unlikely that by chance uh, you would see the sample if you had the, that true population mean, um, means that it's, it's very likely uh, that, that you're able to reject the null hypothesis. So often uh, we, we pick an arbitrary cutoff as p equals uh, 0 0.05. Uh, this, this really depends a lot on what domain you're, you're working with and, and what field you're in and even what problem of, of how, uh, how tight uh, uh, a confidence you want to have or you need to have depending on, on the, uh, the, the stakes uh, involved with, with your particular problem. Um, and, and that's not to say that, that with a lower p-value you can't be wrong, just that it's you know, slightly uh, less likely to, to be the case that, that you're making the wrong uh, conclusion just because of chance. So the, the p-value uh, itself um, also makes the assumption that uh, everything else about your setup is correct. This is just the, the likelihood of of the uh, not being able to reject the null hypothesis um, 
due to the the way that the data looks this has nothing to do with uh how good your data is if, if you have garbage data coming in your, your p-value will be garbage too um or if let's say you use the wrong model or use the wrong statistical test um then uh then the p-value may also not make a lot of sense so let's say you have a, a really strongly skewed distribution and you use the mean instead of the median um that, that has kind of drastically different uh different values uh, be, because of just a small number of outliers. You, you could get a uh, real looking p-value from that, but it, but it might not uh, actually make sense for, for your, your problem. Um, so it's, it's important to, to make sure that we're, we're still following uh, the correct assumptions, even though there, there's some uncertainty in this p-value, we want to be clear about what uncertainty we're modeling with. Um, so uh, in, in practice, uh, we, we've said that this can be a really hard thing to, to know uh, that, that your sample is a good one or that your model uh, has the, uh, the correct assumptions. Um, and, and that's not to say that, that you need to know all of those are, are perfect beyond any doubt uh, to be able to run a p-test. Just keep that in mind as you are uh, as you're analyzing results. And, and in particular, uh, the, the way I think about this is if you have a really small p-value, uh, don't be be super confident that, that it's true. Um, take take uh, p-values that, that say uh, that, that you have a very clear-cut result and, and just treat those with, uh, with a grain of salt um, and, and consider them to have some likelihood of not being true, even if the p-value says that that likelihood is, is negligible. Um, add in a little bit of wiggle room for yourself. Um, and, and we'll, we'll talk about uh, in just a minute maybe how, how we can make some of the p-values a little bit more robust than, uh, than the examples uh, we, we've just shown uh, comparing sample means with, with something like uh, a, uh, a student's t-test. Um, so the, the p-value itself, um, it, has, uh, some, uh, it has some underlying influence from not only the, the mean of the data, of course, but the, the spread. Um, so, so many of the, the examples of the, the tests that, that you may have uh, been introduced to in, if you've taken basic statistics likely assume that you have a symmetric and, and well-behaved uh, variance, um, especially that, that you have a normally distributed, um, normally distributed uh, 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 data set or, or sample. Um, and we'll, we'll get into that in, in just a moment. Um, but uh, just, just to, to keep in mind that, that these are the assumptions that go into some of these statistical tests. And just like choosing the right model, you have to make sure you're, you're choosing the right statistical test. Um, and, and while it's true sometimes that you have lots and lots of data um, or that your data is normally distributed uh, in general, I, I find that, uh, that these tend to be the minority um, rather than, than the rule. Um, and so uh, by default, I, I treat, uh, tend to treat all of my data as uh, assuming that it's, uh, it's not uh, normally distributed and, and use, uh, use tests that are, uh, that are able to capture that sort of data um, just, just to play it safe. Um, and, uh, and, and that saves me from, from having to uh, go in and run the tests to see if they're normal, uh, of which you, you can go and run normality tests if, if you really want to use a uh, a model that has those assumptions, um, or, um, or or you know any of the the other uh, data collection issues um, that uh, that might uh, falsely lead me to believe that that I have well behaved data when I don't. Um, so uh, one one more practical note is that uh, in in many cases what we're going to be doing in these projects is is comparing two models or two sets of features or um, or, or, or two different uh, different approaches to, uh, to to dealing with the output of, of models, and so uh, just to to reiterate, um, the the thing that we actually care about with the models is their their test accuracy or, or their test metrics, um, whether it's accuracy or something else. So uh, just a, a little plug that to make sure you're feeding in the right data into your your p value as well if you you pass in training data into a statistical test, it, it might not tell you much about your the, the generalization of that model, which is, is what you really care about. So let's uh, revisit a, an idea that we talked about uh, earlier when we were talking about uh, ensembles 
and, and random forests and gradient boosting trees, which is a uh, bootstrap. Uh, so this, uh, we, we mentioned before, we'll, we'll come back again, um, and, and here it is. Uh, so bootstrapping is a, a phenomenally uh, useful approach to have in mind uh, when, when doing all sorts of data science, and I think that, that these sort of statistical comparisons are one of the places it, it really shines. Um, so again, just to, to really quickly reiterate bootstrapping, uh, the idea is that we have uh, just one particular sample and we want to be able to say something about the distribution or variance of samples, um, and, and that's really hard to do with, with just one sample. Um, so uh, rather than uh, than rather than saying something just about the the one sample that we have, uh, we resample with replacement from the the one sample that that we do have, um, and, and this bootstrapping uh, approach gives us a uh, a probability distribution of where sample metrics could lie. Uh, that uh, to to the best of our knowledge is a, a good approximation of what our population uh, distribution might look like. So in, in pictures, because I think that's the, the best way to uh, explain bootstrapping like, like most things, uh, the idea is that uh, instead of having uh, some population on the left and pulling a bunch of different samples out of that, uh, we have our, our one population uh, that we pull one sample out of and then resample from that one sample into uh, many proxy samples that, that we think uh, do a pretty good job of replicating the actual set of samples we might have drawn from the population were we able to draw more than one from it. And again, this is done uh, like we described in the, the lecture with, with sampling with replacement from our, our one sample. So uh, to, to give you a, a slightly uh, more specific version of bootstrapping for this idea of uh, statistical tests, uh, let's say that we want to be comparing the mean of some distribution. Uh, so we can uh, sample that distribution and we see that, that we have some uh, mean here for our sample, which uh, is it looks like is, is slightly different from what we our estimate of our null hypothesis for what our population mean looks like. Um, and so we take a bunch of bootstrap samples, and each of those bootstrap samples have slightly different sample means uh, because they're slightly different data sets than our one original sample. Uh, so we're, we're now uh, maybe converging on a, a different mean, but certainly what we're doing is we're uh, asking about how much this mean varies over multiple samples. Um, and so what, uh, what you can get from this is uh, is the uh, the sampling distribution of your data, um, and, and uh, this uh, is centered uh, hopefully at at your sample mean and, and even more hopefully at your population mean, but but more importantly has some distribution here that you can use uh, for figuring out uh, how likely it is that uh, the two samples are some amount apart. Or more generally, just to say how much uncertainty you have about your sample, um, that, that the the likelihood that you picked this one sample, uh, how how biased that is in in any one direction or another, um, and, uh, and and yes, we can do this uh, with uh, real value distributions or with uh, with discretely sampled distributions. Either way, we're we're going to end up with uh, some. Um, some uh, bootstrap distribution that, that has some sample mean and, and variance. So uh, the, the idea of using these to visually show how much uncertainty you have in that one sample that you grabbed uh, is a really nice tool for visualizing data um, that is uh, confidence intervals. And again, hopefully you guys have, have heard of these uh, in, in the abstract um, and, and probably with uh, looking at confidence intervals of, let's say, plus or minus one standard deviation or plus or minus two standard deviations. Um, and, and we're going to talk about the, the bootstrap version of that, which, uh, again, I, I like a little bit better because makes uh, makes some nicer assumptions. So in particular, one assumption of using standard deviations as the basis of your confidence intervals are that you're assuming a normal and symmetric distribution of your sample data. Um, and if so, you know we're familiar with what uh, what confidence intervals uh, may may look like and mean. Uh, so, for example, um, if uh, if you have a confidence interval that's plus or minus one standard deviation away, you are sixty eight percent 
uh, confident that the population mean falls within that. If you are looking at a standard, a confidence interval that's two standard deviations away in each direction, that you're ninety five percent confident that your population mean falls within that, and if you're three standard deviations away, you're you're ninety nine point seven percent confident. So uh, it like like uh, it totally makes sense. Uh, the wider you cast your net, the more likely you are to capture. Uh, the the real uh, population mean or median, whatever statistic you're looking for, uh, just based off the fact that you're uh, allowing more fudge room, you're, you have a, a, a greater tolerance um, from where your sample is drawn. Um, and, and so uh, these varying levels of confidence uh, are, are what make uh, the, the varying levels of a confidence interval. Um, so, uh, the, the the benefit of these confidence intervals is that uh, you can, for almost any type of visualization, uh, then show not only a precise amount, but also uh, where you're uncertain around this. Um, so for example, uh, with let's say uh, variable four or variable five, um, you're you're pretty confident in uh, in where that uh, the top of this bar should be. With variable six, you it seems as though you have no idea, um, and it could just be the case. And in, in fact, it's it's somewhat likely that the height of that bar, the the value of that statistic, would be very different if you were to draw another sample from your population, uh, because there's a, a lot of variance in in uh, the. Uh, the sample that you drew, and, and bootstrapping tells you that because it says your the value that you have is very dependent on uh, on specific data points in that sample. Because if you were to draw with replacement and draw a sample that didn't include that data point, you would get a, a very different value for the the mean of that sample. What what uh, so so that's really nice. Perhaps the thing that, that I like most about these bootstrap samples compared to the standard deviations is uh, look, for example, at, at variable three. You can see that we're, uh, we're uh, have a, a good deal of uh, uncertainty that the, um, that the value of this feature or variable could be higher, but we're pretty confident that it won't be that much lower than it is. Um, and so by, uh, by looking at, uh, at the the uh, empirical bootstrapped confidence intervals. Uh, this interval can be whatever shape it is, and it turns out that, that perhaps we're dependent on uh, on data points, you know, that are either really high or, or either really low, um, and and not uh, not symmetric. So, with the plus or minus uh, standard deviation or two standard deviations, you always have these symmetric um, these symmetric uh, uh, intervals around your sample value. And sometimes that's not accurate, and sometimes it just doesn't make sense. Like for example, um, with uh, with x one and x two, if if you were to have as much of an interval below uh, the 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 sample mean as as you have above here, then the value would be below zero. Um, which, depending on what your variable is, may be total nonsense. And and yet that's something that your model would say is is uh, you know. 60 within 66 uh, or 68 percent likely if if you were to look at one confidence interval. Um, not to say that that's incorrect uh, because uh, it, it it technically is is true that uh, anything that's between let's say one and zero is also between one and negative one. Uh, but uh, but the the values themselves maybe don't make so much sense. Uh, so, so these are really great to, to note in uh, bar plots especially, but all sorts of visualizations. Uh, line plots are, are really good to show the confidence intervals on, on each point. Um, I, I also just want to quickly note that uh, there's something you should be showing in tables or whenever you report a statistic in, in the text too. Um, that, uh, that just saying uh, what some value is uh, in its in its uh, expectation or mean or median really doesn't mean that much if you if you uh, ignore uh, what the variance around it is. Um, so it's a, a really good habit to get into for for data science in general and and especially for for your projects and presentations to to be sure you're talking in confidence intervals and and when you can p values. Um, so uh, just to to reiterate what we said in words, uh, the confidence interval is is uh, this interval that we have, uh, you know, whatever percent confidence um, that the interval is is within a certain value, um, and so uh, so for our 
our plus or minus standard deviation, this was the, the uh, 68, 95, uh, 99.7 rule. Um, that was the, the confidence of, of those intervals. Um, and, and in the bootstrapping version, we're, we're going to create similar uh, percentages of, of how confident we are that the population mean is within the, the range that we're providing. So the, the way that we're going to do that and the way that we're going to create these bootstrap confidence intervals is to take a bunch of samples and look at the, the, the deviation uh, within those samples um, and then ask, uh, ask uh, within, uh, within each of these uh, samples uh, what, uh, so each of these samples will create some interval. And uh, if you were to say, take the you know, middle whatever percent of these intervals, the middle 80% uh, of the intervals and, and throw away the, the highest, um, you know, the, the highest 10 intervals and the, the lowest 10 intervals, um, that, that gives you your 80% confidence interval um, for, for what you think your population uh, statistic uh, should, should be within. Um, and so this is a, this is a, a really nice way to uh, to go from these bootstrap samples that we know uh, how to grab a, a fairly well into uh, the, these really nice confidence intervals. So uh, as as usual, you you won't have to implement these by hand, uh, but it's it's still good to know that that what you're doing is you're taking an interval based off of a bunch of bootstraps, uh, just so you you understand the process. Um, and, and how this relates to things like skew and, um, and mean versus median. Um, the, uh, the, the width of which you take your bootstraps um, will depend uh, often on what, uh, what p-value you're, you're looking at. So most people who set a, a p-value threshold of, of 0.05 for significance uh, will take a 95% bootstrap confidence interval to show uh, about how much variation uh, you you could uh, have uh, within your sample and still be within uh, a p-value of 0 0.05 of of uh, it falling within within that confidence interval. Um, and, and again, like the uh, like the normal distribution version, the more confident you are, the wider a net you're casting. So a 95% confidence interval will be much wider than an 80% confidence. You, you can be less certain the, the more specific you are with your estimate. So there's, there's some inherent trade-off here between uh, how confident you are and how precise you can be. Um, we, we talked a, a little bit about the, uh, the, the cons of some of the standard deviation-based confidence intervals. Uh, so I, I talked about implementing these. Uh, like, uh, like, like always, there's, there's code for this. Uh, unfortunately, for, for some reason, uh, SciPy and, and Scikit-Learn don't have a, a really nice um, confidence interval uh, uh, functions built in. Um, so, uh, so Scikits has the a bootstrap um, bootstrap function that that is really easy to to install and use. Um, here's uh, here's where it lives, and uh, and also here's a link to. Uh, some documentation for a really nice tutorial that, that uses this to uh, to show an example of a, of a confidence interval um, that's uh, that's built using Bootstrap. Um, this is, uh, is is actually a blog post from one of my friends. So I've, I've been using this documentation for uh, for a very long time, um, probably since it, it was published in in 2012. Um, definitely not uh, not an official one, but but one that I found uh, is is really intuitive to to rely back to. Uh, so we we've talked about uh, not having a lot of data um, to to pull from, and in fact, only having one sample distribution. Uh, yeah, one sample um, rather than a, a distribution of samples. The other thing that we mentioned was an assumption of the student t-test type uh, statistical analyses is the assumption of normality, um, and we've we've talked a little bit about this already. Uh, but but just to make it even more clear. Um, when we're, we're looking at, at these sort of t-tests or z-tests, um, what they rely on is how many standard deviations away from the mean you are. And of course, when you have a non-symmetric distribution, the standard deviation doesn't really make sense um, because being above or below the, um, the, the actual uh, sample mean uh, will give you a, a very different, uh, different uh, 
a distribution mass inclusion for a fixed confidence interval, uh, meaning that, uh, that that you're you're capturing different amounts of, of data um, when your 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 confidence interval is is a set amount. If your distribution is is not symmetric, which which makes sense, uh, that the going in two different directions uh, leads to uh, to two different shapes. So the the easiest way to get around this, and again the 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 one that I use all the time by default, is to use a non-parametric test. Uh, so this is uh, is usually based off of of medians um, rather than means, and and especially looks at the ranking of data points uh, across your two models rather than the, um, the the actual values of them. Um, so so those of you familiar with the the, the correlation analogy, it's it's the uh, the the Spearman correlation instead of the the Pearson, um, and uh, and. And so, so this idea of using ranks is is really nice in that uh, it, it gets away a lot of the issues of non-symmetric or skewed distributions, um, and and it can compare across those um, th those uh, different types of, of shapes of distributions quite well. Uh, there are uh, lots that you can choose from. the The most generic that, that I typically use is the Man Whitney or the the Wilcoxon rank sum test. Uh, it's really the the same test uh, branded under under two names. Um, and we'll uh, just like a z-score test or a student's t-test, uh, spit out a p-value that you can interpret uh, as your your likelihood of rejecting the null distribution. Um, I uh, I really like these non-parametric tests um, because uh, you're you're asking uh, if if one model fits the data better than another or if they're statistically um, indistinguishable. Um, and, and so this is, is fantastic for, let's say, comparing a SVM versus a random forest versus a linear regression on your project. Uh, if you feed in the, the output, uh, let's say, accuracy from those models, then this, uh, this rank sum test will tell you how likely it is that one of those is better than another, um, which is exactly the sort of thing you'd want to be reporting for your projects. Um, and, and what I love about these also is that you don't have to just uh, have accuracy. You can pass in any metric about the, the model and in its results. So uh, for example, the, the area under, under the ROC curve or the, the false positive rate, true positive rate, you know, sensitivity versus specificity. Each problem will have different trade-offs along those spectrums that we talked about before. Um, and, and whichever metric you, you want, um, these, these uh, statistical tests are saying, according to that metric, um, how do these models? Um, so uh, yeah, please, uh, please do include these in your, your projects and your write-ups. And while I tend to focus on the comparison between models just because that's what I'm, I'm used to, uh, I, I should also say that, that uh, for those of you not doing uh, machine learning style projects, um, that, that this absolutely applies to, uh, to inferences about your, your population statistics as well, um, not just uh, comparing uh, two samples like, like you would outputs from models. Um, and uh, and uh, as, as I mentioned before, the, these unparametric tests are, are great for uh, skewed distributions. And, and just a little, uh, little added plug here, if, if you're using, if you think you have skewed distributions, um, which again, I often assume to be the case just because it's easier than, than actually checking, um, that, uh, that, that medians uh, tend to be better for skewed distributions than, than mean. Uh, so this, uh, this rank sum test uh, is, uh, is implemented in, in SciPy um, and, and is really easy to use. Um, Make sure that you're uh, you're noting the uh, the tuple uh, that's passed back to you, and that the the second value is the the p value you're looking for. The the first is your test statistic. Um, so so just note that if you find you have some value that seems absurdly small. Um, so just to to wrap up really quick, uh, a few uh, other minor things that uh, that could come up. Um, we uh, we've shown this this comic a few times here because it's a, a great example of p values. Um, and especially the, the p-values uh, don't necessarily mean that uh, a relationship is absolutely true, just that uh, what, what you're seeing is unlikely to be by chance. Uh, but that said, if you uh, test enough things that are very unlikely, eventually one of them will be true. Uh, that's just, uh, just the way that statistics work. 
Um, and so, uh, so this approach uh, is something uh, that uh, that can be taken advantage of if you're sloppy with your statistics and really have uh, a personal incentive for your project to work out well. For example, it being your job to publish interesting things that uncover new patterns in data. Um, and in this practice uh, is, is often called p-hacking, uh, where we're trying to set up conditions where we get statistically significant p-values. Um, and, and maybe the, the most common and easiest way to do this is just to do lots and lots of comparisons until you find one that happens to be true by chance. Uh, there are lots of ways to uh, mitigate this, but the, the simplest is just to, uh, to penalize you um, with a stricter p-value the more tests that you perform. Um, now, the most common version of this is called the Bonferroni correction, where you multiply your threshold by the number of tests that you run. Um, that, uh, that often is, is overly conservative, um, and you may miss some relationships um, in, in your data, especially if you're running a, a decent number of, of tests uh, be, because it's, it's so overly conservative. So there's others um, that, uh, that look at, uh, at family distributions. Um, for example, uh, the, the one in, um, in uh, scikit-learn here um, shows you uh, a uh, Benjamini Hochberg procedure um, in this uh, family of distribution approach, um, which, uh, which gives you a, a p-value that's uh, maybe a bit more realistic than the, uh, than the Bonferro. Um, so again, uh, don't don't need to uh, super understand the math that goes into adjusting p-values. Just know that if you're running a whole bunch of statistical tests, um, I might be expecting you to correct for all of the tests that, that you run um, if uh, if you're suspected of of p-hacking. Um, one uh, one last thing to close things out is that uh, that we talked uh, 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 we alluded to permutation tests in a, a prior uh, lecture and, and this is a great place to to touch back on them. Um, this is the idea of asking whether uh, some relationship uh, exists by chance. Um, so in the, in the permutation test, what you do is you take a column of your data set and randomly shuffle it. Um, and, and ask whether or not some relationship still exists or not. Um, so the, the maybe most classic version of the permutation test is to, to shuffle your output labels. Um, and, and this tells you uh, how likely you are to be able to guess the correct answers even without knowing what the outputs look like, um, either through, uh, through things like uh, skewed uh, um, and, and unbalanced uh, output variables, um, or, or sometimes uh, things like clustering with your input variables, but, but typically this is more on the output side. Um, and uh, and uh, a way to measure how much this would happen by chance um, is, is to, uh, yeah, take a, 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 for example, NumPy shuffle and shuffle up your, uh, your, your output labels um, and, and fit a model to those. Um, if you uh, you're you're saving data, make sure that you uh, you don't shuffle your original copy so that you can you can still recover the actual patterns in your data. Um, the permutation test that we alluded to earlier in the semester is about uh, shuffling the columns that have to do with input features, which is to say uh, this is telling you how much your model performance relies on that specific feature. If you're relying quite a bit on on the values of that variable, then shuffling it. Um, uh, will will have a, a huge impact on performance, and if you don't really care about it, then it shouldn't affect performance nearly at all. Uh, so this is a, a nice way to look at the um, the importance of each feature, even in uh, models where it's really hard to do that, like nonlinear SVMs or neural networks, where we said before that it wasn't quite so easy as it is with linear regression or or random forest to say how important a feature is. This is a, a data driven way to do that. Um, and, and this is nice because, uh, again, you uh, maintain the distribution of the input data. If it's you know, highly biased or skewed uh, one way or the other, you still capture that. Um, and and you, also, uh, you also still remain uh, with a model of, of the same size and complexity. It's not like you're removing uh, inputs to your model, which would make you, you have to change the, the whole model itself. Um, and, and adding even more uh, co confounding effects to, uh, to figuring out how important this feature is.
uh, that uh, that permutation test is uh, is again uh, implemented in, in Scikit-Learn for those of you interested in, in using this to find out feature importance, uh, which is uh, I, I think a very fun thing to do in in these final. Okay, so we uh, we're having a, a bit of a, a long lecture today. Um, not uh, not terrible considering how many different ideas we we just threw at you. But these these ideas of uh, of how to systematically and statistically analyze your the output of your models or or your the relationships in your data is I, I think really really important for uh, communicating uh, uh, quality. Um, quality data science outputs um, from, from your work. Um, so uh, so uh, including these statistically in, in tables and text and also visually in figures uh, is, is really important to say ex very explicitly how uncertain you are about the, the things that you're saying. Um, confidence intervals are a great way to, uh, to show this, uh, especially in anything with, with uh, bars or lines where it's easy to just uh, extend the length of those with confidence intervals. Um, the, uh, the confidence intervals can be based off of uh, standard deviations, but uh, I, I prefer the bootstrap method for these. Um, and, and just like I prefer the non-parametric version of hypothesis testing, uh, which is, is really important for saying whether you think two sample means, for example, the outputs of two different models, or a sample in a population, for example, saying something about your uh, your original data source, uh, actually are different or the same. Um, and uh, and and please, uh, you know, include these uh, these intervals as well as these p values whenever you can when you're reporting the results of your um, your your uh, data science projects. Um, so hopefully uh, the, the broad ideas here were at least somewhat familiar to most of you, even if the, the implementation and the, the flavors like bootstrapping or non-parametric versions of hypothesis testing or confidence intervals may have been new. Um, hopefully uh, you know, having uh, implemented versions of these will, will make it easy to, uh, to take these, uh, these new flavors and, uh, and tie them into your, your existing knowledge. Um, but uh, I, I think this is a really critical thing to, to have a good handle on as we get into the, the end of our projects and really wrapping up and, and communicating what it is you're finding and what patterns uh, actually are, are in your data or not. Um, so uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully uh, we can have a good discussion about this uh, in class. Um, bring any uh, questions, thoughts, or concerns, and I'll, uh, I'll see you online.